As we suggested to you in the first of this series, our Greek mythology did not arise from a single source, but as was usually the case among the ancient peoples, the mythological systems gradually amalgamated. They came together as separate culture units became more commonly aware of their relationships and values. Also, as remote regions attained civilization, and in the course of wars and conquests, they gradually assembled an almost incredible diversity of names local names for deities, names for principles observed by man. On the level of observation, his findings were usually similar, if not identical. But because of language barrier and from lack of communication uh, with those of similar interests in other parts of the world, each of these culture groups developed its own names for almost the same ideas and principles. As time went on, uh, most of the smaller groups, the smaller culture groups, united to form the great group of Hellenic culture patterns, which we have come to know as Greece. Even as late as the Roman conquest, however, we cannot say that the Greeks themselves were fully aware of all of their own borrowings. They were not certain that they had exhausted the possibilities of the various peoples that had come under their domination. This, of course, is brought to our attention by the episode of the Areopagus when uh, St. Paul saw the altar to the unknown God. He inquired and learned that a plague had attacked Athens and that offerings had been made to all the gods that the people knew, but the plague continued. So they made an altar to any god whom they had neglected. Immediately, the plague ceased. This indicates that the Greeks had no actual calendar on this uh, problem of deities, and were not sure as to whether some of the similar divinities were identical or not. Thus, after a long period of time, we come upon another complicating episode, and that was the rise of Greek drama. Your Greek dramatists, like your Elizabethan dramatists in England, took some astonishing liberties with mythology, history, and related matters. It was convenient in the plays that persons who had lived at remote times should appear contemporary, so they were brought together. It was important that certain things should happen, therefore deities were held responsible. And in many respects, the dramatists made the distinguishing of the deities not almost not all not only difficult but almost impossible in some instances. Hesiod points out that there were also layers of interpretation. And we have suggested already that some of these layers arose as early as the second millennium BC, probably between the 12th and 15th centuries BC, where already the moving mind of man had outgrown the interpretations he had given to his own gods. It is impossible to hold the human being to interpretations that no longer satisfy his consciousness. He will not worship deities whose codes and actions and conducts are inferior to his own. And as he grew, he began to refine and interpret. 
and among the first refinements that primitive man made, whether it was in Greece or India or in the Polynesians, was to cause a remoteness between himself and his deities. He no longer conceived them as merely a dwelling above or around the next hillside. They were no longer merely separated by a river or a stream, nor did they resemble closely himself or his ancestors. By degrees, the deities came to be regarded as solitary, separate, away from the common humanity of things of an order or kind of their own. And the moment this began to develop as an interpretive move, the next was inevitable, because early, at least not any later than the beginning of the 10th century BC, Egypt and the Etruscans, the Chaldeans and Babylonians, were already embarking in the thrilling adventure of the Sea of Science. Science is not as new as we think. It was cultivated long ago. And the one of the first attitudes of science always is this search for reality. And primitive scientists were well aware that the mythological accounts familiar in their times could not be literally accepted. They were fully aware that there were explanations for things far more reasonable than the folklore and more susceptible of value to the individual. As a result of this dawn scientific attitude, it became customary to interpret the deities more and more psychologically, to regard them either as physiological or psychological processes in nature. Thus, instead of thinking of them as persons, they came to be thought of as laws, as energies, as fields of power, of uh, archetypal patterns, of uh, mathematical formulas, as Pythagoras reported in his visit to the temples of the Egyptians, where he said the gods were all presented to the priests in the shapes of geometrical solids in order that their esoteric principles might be more easily comprehended. We've already noted that it was unlikely that the age of Pericles, the great age of the rise of Greek literature, philosophy, and science, could have continued generally to accept a literal belief in the ancient folklore the Greek provinces, any more than it would be possible to bind us totally to the concepts and hypotheses of gypsies, or to cause us to return again to the primitive attitudes of our ancestors relating to death and immortality, things of that nature. Man does not go backward. He moves forward slowly and with difficulty, but always forward. And in his religion, his forward motion is his eternal search for the discovery of principles beneath personalities, legends, lore, myth, fable. So by the time we are interested in this situation, Greek mythology had already become the language of Greek philosophy. We mentioned in the first lecture that there would be nothing more terrible than to assume that Greek mythology is identical with Greek religion. Such is not the case. Any more than it would be fair to say uh, that Grimm's fairy tales are identical with modern science. Nor should we assume that those who love the story of Cinderella necessarily believe it. Yet when we read Cinderella, there is something believable about it. And this thing that is believable about it is our own internal conviction of the victory of right. It becomes a moral legend, a fable uh, which has to do with the final and ultimate triumph of good over evil, of virtue over conspiracy, of love over hate, 
of unselfishness over selfishness and of purity over corruption. These things are believable. They were believable to the Greeks in their times, in their legends also. So gradually the believing of legend moved from the literal to the moral, to the ethical, to the cultural, perhaps finally to the scientific, philosophical, and ultimately to the spiritual. But always it was a way of unfolding a meaning in things, rather than a plain or simple acceptance of the outer structure of fable or myth. We've already given a brief summary of the creation, as it was set forth, at least in the time of Hesiod, and uh, later unfolded by Plato and Proclus. We might add something, however, to the previous account in order to make it as complete as possible. We know that from the mysterious egg of Thales, which we described, how this egg formed out of the strivings of ether and chaos, finally burst into magnificent light, only ultimately to break over and give birth out of itself to the luminous deity Thales, winged many-headed, many-armed, that was to be the symbol of the light of creation bursting forth out of the darkness of potential. The shell of the egg of Thales therefore became heaven and earth. Raised upon great and immortal foundations, its upper golden hemisphere became the sky, and its lower silver hemisphere became nature. And thus we had a rise in our myth, the first contrasting of God and nature, of the divine and the mortal, of the eternal and the temporal, and the gradual emergence of these polarities and dualities, which were ultimately to be personified in the Greek legend as Uranus and Gaia. Uranus was heaven, Gaia was earth, and from the union of heaven and earth there came forth a number of strange and wonderful beings, beings that uh, Berossus tells us about in his Chaldean history, but about which we have only legends, such as we find in the Homeric episodes and epics, or in the Arabian Nights, or in the great Baratas and Puranic literature of India. For of the union of heaven and earth, united by the mysterious power of this ethereal, intangible agent called Eros, love, the first love of heaven and earth brought forth a strange order of beings, or several strange orders of beings, of which the best known to us are the Titans. Now the Titans were twelve in number, and they corresponded in the Greek legend to uh, the Kumara, or the Virgin Youths of ancient East Indian philosophy. The Titans were not truly of this earth, but as the term has come to su suggest, they were titanic forces, titanic principles. They were the firstborn of the striving of heaven and earth. As the Chinese would say, they were created from the union and commixture of yang and yin. From these two striving principles, all multitudes and diversities having originated. From the union of heaven and earth also were born the Cyclopes. Now I understand we've recently had another most picture outbreak of Cyclops in the uh, story of Sindad the Sailor, which probably would be a great success, but it has no, no resemblance to the Arabian Nights. This uh, story, and the uh, story as told by Homer for that matter, indicates the Cyclops were deities with a single eye. They were usually represented as giants and not always friendly to man. But when you go back into your earliest Greek philosophy, as we find 
is the Neoplatonist interpretation of Homer's uh, Odyssey, we discover with Hesiod that the Cyclops was not a being with one eye originally. He was a being originally seeing in all directions. That was the meaning of his name. And I suppose the Greeks, trying to figure out how an individual could see in all directions, finally concluded that he must have one eye in the center of his head as being the only possible way of answering it. And in the due course, naturally, the eye in the center of the head moved into the center of the face, although that was not where it was originally intended to be. The Cyclops uh, is also a psychological entity, according to Iamblichus in his dissertation on the mysteries. But a cyclop represents that part of the human consciousness which cannot be captured by the illusion of time and space. It is that part of man that regardless of how many mistakes he makes, always sees in all directions. The problem then remains to clarify this, to fulfill the psychological uh, fact that every individual knows only only a few persons know that they know. What within each individual is all the perspective or power necessary for his own orientation. In addition to the Cyclopes and uh, the Titans, there were also many armed beings and giants of that time. The many arms signifying the many activities of principles in their motion. All of these beings, according to the Greek legend, were invisible. They were not down upon our earth at all, but in an intangible psychic atmosphere. And it was here that the great primordial struggles between the orders of life took place. It was here also that later, the powers of the Titans, or the twelve primordial energies of space, came to be gradually organized into a series of twelve or dodecahedrons, as Pythagoras called them, which in ultimate form became consistently the number of the gods. So from the twelve titans, we naturally have the twelve Olympian deities, who were drawn by a curious cross from several levels and orders of life. We also pointed out that by descent, we had the uh, gradual emergence of Zeus or Jupiter as the Lord of the gods, that he had violently taken the kingdom of Cronus, his father, who in turn had violently seized the throne of Uranus, or Uranus, his father, who in turn had violently built up his empire with the primordial substance of space. Later, uh, there would descend from Zeus a series of further deities, like Dionysus Bacchus Zagros, and a cycle of lesser divinities that were to gradually descend all the way until they became the Nymphs and Ori and all of the deities of forests and streams and mountains. Now Zeus stands as a very interesting personality in the Greek mythology. We must try to orient him. He is the third person of a great triad. And we told you last week that all Greek mythology breaks down into these triads, of which the first person is always called the father. The second is called the power, and the third is called the mind. So every triad consists of a father, a power, and a mind. And these are referred to as the great fountains in the Chaldean oracles of the Zoroasters. Zeus, therefore, in the triad that we are now considering, represents the mind of a triad. He also signifies the apex, or the upper part of the mundane world. Zeus, who perhaps is among the least of the beings of heaven, is by contrast among the greatest of the beings of nature. For he represents a point of medium ground 
between heaven and earth, between God and nature, between Uranus and Gaia, who are to produce between them or spin between them the web of existence. Though we know that Zeus was able to escape with the aid of his mother from the effort of Cronus to swallow him and destroy him, and that he so escaped by having a stone put in his place. Also that he was the sixth child that Cronus would have destroyed. The six is, of course, the symbol of the directions and of labor. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. Therefore, the six has always been symbolical of a process or cycle of creating procedures. How was it, therefore, that Zeus was able to escape being devoured? And the stone which was put in his place was not detected so that later Zeus surviving was also able to restore the other deities that Cronus had devoured earlier. And from these deities, uh, another sequence of interesting myths and legends descend. For our purpose, Zeus or Jupiter, therefore, is the only child of the gods that survived Cronus at that time. Therefore, he must represent a principle in nature that survives time, over which Cronus has dominion and control. Zeus or Jupiter is therefore the victor over time. He is able not only to be victorious over time, but to usurp it, take it over, place himself upon the throne of the fates occupied by time, and become the ruler of the world. Now what is this power that can overcome time? And the Greeks themselves, analyzing the situation, uh, took the attitude that it is something which we call, although they did not have the word, we call consciousness. For consciousness alone is greater than time. Consciousness is the only thing that can survive time. Consciousness is the only thing which can attain to the realization of immortality and destroy the final power of time to destroy. So to the Greeks, Jupiter or Zeus represented the last of the children of heaven and earth and represented also the principle of the power of consciousness placed in the middle of the ground or a middle diffusion between the above and the below. And by virtue of its own peculiar nature, the predestined and foreordained ruler of the world, all things must ultimately come under the control of consciousness. Zeus having attained to this unique position also presents us with a series of other very interesting Dramatic, dramatic elements. Zeus stands at the apex of a kind of pyramid of, as of ascending powers. These powers are ascending from nature by steps, are generally affirmed to represent the body, mind, and soul of man and nature. Therefore, there is this order of ascending things growing out of the earth, the earth born. And there is an order of descending powers coming down from heaven or from the sky, spiritual energies or agencies. And in the consciousness level of egoic selfhood, the Greeks believe that the divine and natural myth are meant. Therefore, that man was truly a progeny of heaven and earth, occupying a middle distance and a key achieving to sovereignty over both extremes or opposites. Zeus having thus represented a certain power, we can parallel him for simple and useful purposes <coughs> with a counterpart who occupies almost identically the same relation. 
And that is in the Valsum Saga, or the Sigurd Saga. We have Odin, the great deity, ruling over the great palace of Asgard, surrounded by his twelve aces, or deities, the same as the Olympian family. And Zeus, and Zeus or Wotan, or Odin, all represent this immortal mortal, all represent this mysterious power uh, which alone is capable by consciousness of becoming the ruler of things. Consciousness, however, both in the Greek and in the Nordic legendary, has one limitation, and that is that consciousness can solve every mystery but itself. It cannot solve the mystery of its own nature. It cannot solve the mystery of its own origin or the mystery of its own destiny. As a result of that, Odin, of course, hung himself or was crucified upon the Yggdrasil tree in the effort to learn the mystery of his own destiny. This being deprived and denied him, he descended to the roots of the tree and cast his eye into Mirva's pool in search also of the secret of his own destiny. This again was not sufficient. He finally called upon the norms, the fates, they could not tell him. So he invoked Erda, the Earth Mother, and she would not tell him. No matter how he turned, Odin could never discover the mystery of his own destiny. And it is the same concept, perhaps, that we have in connection with human consciousness, which is capable of defining everything except itself. Studying the destiny of everything except its own nature and sealing the doom of everything, but unable to distinguish the boundaries of itself. In any event, this was the Greek thinking at that stage that gave us this grand, magnificent, erratic, forlorn despot, Zeus. With the midst of all his grandeur, and was unable to escape the mystery of his own destiny and the equally mysterious and amazing problem of his nagging wife. These things even the gods were not able to conquer. The Greeks had a sense of humor in these matters and a very shrewd observation of the psychological elements of human nature. On Thessaly, in a comparatively deserted region, stood Mount Olympus, and here was convened the great council of the gods. In very early times, it is possible that the Greeks actually believed that there was some kind of a meeting of immortals on the top of the Olympian peak, which to them certainly was a grand, inspiring snow clad mountain. But with the passing of time, many men climbed Olympus and knew perfectly well that it was not a physical mountain that was to be considered the abode of the gods. So following Hesia and thinking in terms of the elder Ada of the Nordic peoples, we could get a certain vision of the world as it was. When the time came for the diffusion of the natural world to take place within the under hemisphere of the great age, this great under-hemisphere was filled with a strange power, which was itself a god. And this power was one of the titans. And this power was called Oceanus. And this was the one titan that played an isolated game. He refused to join with the other deities in any of their conspiracies against anybody. He was alone, and remote, and separate. He dwelled in space, and his name was Ocean. And it was upon the surface of Ocean, and in the midst of Ocean, that the first land, the first part of the physical nature of things came into existence. The Greek legends do not tell us how this happened, but perhaps we can learn the same idea from the Nihonji of the Japanese, which is their great national epic, or the Kojiki. Here we find the gods leaning over the edge of a bridge, dipping their spear points into the waters of eternity. They lifted the spear points out of the waters and the mud 
clinging to the bottom of the spear points, falling back upon the waters of eternity, resulted in the coming of the islands, which naturally were going to be Japan, which, the being a Japanese story, was the first, best, and only important land created for a very long while. But the Greek myth could well have begun in about the same manner, although Hesiod does not give us the details. But we do know that in the midst of ocean, as in a constant and ancient guardian, the earth appeared. That the earth was flat, according to their thinking. And it was turned up at the outer edge like a dinner plate, so that the waters would not uh, fall over the edge into the world itself. And in the midst of this world, as in the midst of the Midgard, the Midgard world of the Nordics, rose the great mountain Olympus, which was the Axel Mountain, that went all the way up to the sky. And on this Axel Mountain was the abode of the deities, particularly the great throne of Zeus, where he sat in wonder and majesty over the entire mystery of creation. It was Solon later who studied this problem, discovered what he considered to be the cause of earthquakes, namely that someone had caused the boat of the earth to rock in the sea of ocean. And many ancient uh, scientific principles were built upon this concept. The Neoplatonists tell us that the Titan Ocean was equivalent to our concept not of water, but of ether. And we have the same in the story of, of the anal analysis of Anaximander and Anaximedes in their effort to discover the primary elements of things, fighting over the elements of fire and water as being primordial in the creation of the universe. The water of life, however, the great water of these sacred books of all people, seems to have been this water of ocean, the Shemayim of the ancient Hebrew Kabbalists. And this was the living water, the water of life, the water of energy, the field of ether, the mysterious Aquarian fluid of Canopus, the water of electricity, represented by the Egyptian glyph, which we use now in astrology as the sign of Aquarius. This symbolism implied not just water, but a great human field, a great supporting humidity of energy by which all things were nourished and supported. Our common water or fluid belonged rather to Poseidon or Neptune. But the great God Ocean was the root of waters, the principle of waters, the divine power of nutrition that was within the energy of the great humid world around us. So we have the worlds floating upon the surface of ocean as upon the great surface of space. We have the planets moving around it in the great sea of ocean. We also have the mountain of the gods rising in the midst, ascending to the great heights and peaks, where the Olympian concourse met and carried on its uh, various judicial and uh, governmental procedures. The next point that I think we should mention in connection with this is that in the development of the great circle of the basic Greek deities, a situation arose which was not dissimilar to that again which we have in the Nordic and Germanic religions. Namely that this twelve or circle was composed of deities of more than one origin. These deities, some apparently of greater significance than others, constitute an attempt to tell us the origins of these different divinities that were later to be united into one concept. And out of these origins we learn that there were three primary and important origins of the greater deities of the Greeks. <coughs> the first origin was the Titanic, the older gods, the very ancient and believed ones, coming from the dim dawn of pre-Hellenic culture. These were the highest and most ancient, but in the course of time, their places were taken over by more brilliant and more recent divinities, 
and they were pushed backward until they became honored, honored and venerated, but had to share their honors with the newer gods of new peoples rising up and achieving their political and spiritual destinies. <coughs> the second order of deities were those which descended directly from Zeus or belonged to his own order of life. They might therefore be called the direct uh, progeny of Zeus, either with others of his own order, the Titans, or with his other uh, levels of divinity arising out of the union of other Titans and belonging therefore to the Titanic order. <coughs> the third order arose from Zeus and the other deities uh, deriving through relationship progeny from lower orders of beings as from nymphs or from mortals. The union of the deities and mortals generally resulting in the generation of heroes or divinely anointed beings in whose natures were both divine and human qualities. Almost all of your savior gods, whether of Greece or any other group, arise in this latter order, nearly always being a union of divine and mortal elements. In the case, for instance, of Zeus, the great deity, the great savior divinity of the Greeks, Dionysus, was the result of the union of Jupiter or Zeus, the, de the deity, and a mortal woman, Semele. This, and the turn, is found in other religious systems. So we may affirm that there were three orders, those who came from the ancient gods, those who came from a median group, the level of Zeus himself, those who came to the union of the uh, Olympian deities with mortals or semi-mortal creatures. Nearly always these semi-mortal creatures ultimately attained to heaven, were picked up to become constellations, and their legends have become the great folk hero tales of uh, Greek and other mythologies. Now we have approaching us this problem of a cycle of 12 powers. We have to analyze this a little bit, uh, not only from the standpoint of mythology, but in an effort to, to grasp its possible meaning to us today. <coughs> we must have certain modern understanding of this. The ancients recognized, of course, a 12-fold system of the universe. This system they tied to the zodiac. They therefore recognize 12 kinds or aspects of the divine power of God. These 12 aspects or attributes were deified and therefore became 12 lesser gods existing in the nature of the one greater God. The one greater God enclosed these 12. They were the parts and members of himself or itself. <coughs> but for practical purposes, they became individual divinities. In this case, we have therefore a list or order of deities which gradually came to take over the thinking of the Greeks and became the elements or letters of a kind of alphabet telling us the energies and powers <coughs> resident in the divine nature. Now, I had something on this on the board, and somebody disposed of it. So we'll start it, and for those of you who are interested, we will just work on it from here. There's no particular need to go on to the board. But I can give you the essential elements which perhaps you would like to make note of, in order that you may have a record of this particular problem. Now, in the Olympian group of 12, the deities <coughs> that are taken uh, include certain of the titans and certain divinities that are not titans. And they may be called, therefore, for all pur and purposes, uh, that the superior group of these deities were all the children of Cronus and Rhea. Cronus being tied in its most common uh, understanding. Andreas representing place or condition. 
receptive to time <coughs> and be a kind of space mother. From the union, therefore, of Cronus and Rhea were actually born twelve powers, six male and six female, becoming what might be termed polarities. But our present concern is only with those who entered into the Olympian compact or became united in the great Olympic bond. And this bond becomes important to us later because it has to do with the, the mystery rituals and the religious dramas of these people. So we have, as the children of Cronus and Rhea, who are enclosed in the Olympian group, the following. Jupiter and Juno, or Zeus and Hera. But for our simple purposes, I think the Latin terms are probably better known to most of us, so we'll give them the preference. Thus, Jupiter and Juno are brother and sister, and also husband and wife. This is later to become significant. The next of the Titans who becomes involved in this is Neptune, or Poseidon. Ceres, or Demeter, who is the uh, goddess of the harvest, and Vesta, who is the symbol of purity, and from whom are termed the Vestal Virgins of Rome, are said to have originated. So of the ancient ones, there were five titans that formed part of the great Olympian dodecahedron. Jupiter, Juno, Neptune, Ceres, and Vesta. These belong to the old gods, to the deities that had a great and ancient tradition and have been never remembered out of the dawn of the Greek way of life. Then the Olympian family was blessed with two deities that were the direct progeny of the union of Jupiter and Juno. And these two were Mars and Vulcan. Mars, of course, we all recognize as the deity of war. Vulcan was the spirit behind the volcanic action of nature, and is supposed to have had his forges under Mount Etna. He is the one who made the armaments and shields, weapons and helmets of the gods and also did a little general uh, metallurgical research on the side. He had quite a part to play in the story. Though by other means, <coughs> which would become part of the great scandal of Olympus, uh, there are certain other deities were introduced into this situation, resulting from the union of Jupiter with nymphs, mortals, and other beings that do not belong to the original order. And from these, the most familiar are Apollo, Diana, Venus, and Mercury. Now that leaves out only one that re represents and stands to the peculiar virtue of Jupiter, and about which we are assured that could no scandal be possible. And that was the twelfth divinity, uh, Pallas Athena, or Minerva, who was born out of the head of Zeus himself, without union with any other person. Now these legends, of course, either have to mean something or else they are a shocking waste of time. But the more we study them, the more we realize that they must mean something. The structure is too intricate and goes on into too many devious passageways to be meaningless in itself. Thus we have a, a little order of deities here, which uh, perhaps do not uh, form in any particular pattern. Well, look who's with us. I'm going to put that there for my ambrosia until a little later. Thank you very much. And uh, here is our cast of characters for this phase of the drama. And we might say that the Greeks themselves at an early time attempted to associate this cast with the Zodiac. But their associations between these two levels of things were never completely clear or consistent. And there are at least a dozen different systems of these analogies available. 
Therefore, we only say that this is typical of the arrangement that was made to identify the 12 deities with the great machinery of the astrochemical development of nature. So we have the following little cast of characters, uh, as we have already listed them. This is more or less a summary for bringing it into a picture. First of all, Jupiter, associated with the side of Sagittarius, descended from Cronus and Rhea, the Titans. Secondly, Juno, associated with the sign of Libra, descended also from uh, Cronus and Rhea, and likewise the mother of Mars and Vulcan. This gets to be a little complicated, quite a family tree here before we get through with it. Third, well, on our list, Neptune or Poseidon. Neptune was the son also of Cronus and Rhea, the Titan. And he is associated with the sign of the fishes, Pisces. The next deity is Ceres, or Cori, the daughter of Cronus and Rhea, both titans, and connected closely with the idea of the storing and preserving of the harvest through winter, and with tithing and the setting aside of the gift of the grave. She has to do with uh, the death and resurrection of plant life and therefore the ancients sometimes at least associated her with Capricorn. Apollo is associated with Leo. He is a son of Jupiter. Vulcan, about the Diana, uh, the goddess of the moon, was the twin sister of Apollo a daughter of Jupiter, and her symbol was the sign of Cancer. Vulcan was also the son of Jupiter and Juno, and his sign was associated with Scorpio. Minerva was the daughter of Jupiter without a mother, born from his own mind, like Brunhilde, his thought daughter who carried on, as in the Nordic legends, the Blue Hill of myth, carried on always the secret thoughts of her father. He, she was associated with the sign of Aquarius. The next was Mars, Mars, <coughs> the son of Jupiter and Juno, and associated with the sign of Aries. Then Venus, who was the daughter of Jupiter, who is associated with the sign of Taurus. And according to Hesiod, there were two forms of this divinity, one of which was very ancient and was the daughter of Uranus, or heaven. She is naturally associated with beauty and uh, with art, music, and things of that nature, and only later with amatory interests. Mercury was a son of Jupiter, he is associated with the sign of Gemini, and he was the messenger of the gods, the chronicler and scribe, and the patron deity of Thebes. The last is Vesta, a child of Cronus and Rhea, the Titans, and therefore descending from what Thomas Taylor calls the Titanic monad. And she, Vesta, was the symbol of purity, of chastity, of protection, and of all of the best and noblest aspects of the home, and dedication, and the religious life, and she was under the rulership or was associated with the sign of Virgo, being the Vestal Virgin. Now this gives us the cast of characters in this circle. And we know that as soon as this cast was developed, that the theological pattern moved almost instantly into the astronomical. And from this point on, the deities and their uh, related forces began to cause the emergence or coming forth of nature, the creation of the world. And in the creation of the world, uh, we find a series 
of very interesting legends or myths. One of which involves another Titan, who was a progeny of Cronus and Rhea, and that was the Titan Prometheus. Prometheus, therefore, belonged to the old order of gods. He is the one who uh, attempted to bring the fire to earth and was punished by Zeus uh, by being bound to the peak of Mount Caucasus with the vulture gnawing upon his liver. And it remained for one of the heroes, born of the Olympian deity and the mortal, Hercules, to rescue Prometheus from this long punishment. So among your heroes, you have beings of the order of Achilles, Hercules, Odysseus, born of deities and mortals. And you also have the demigodlets, such as Dionysius and Bacchus, who became closely identified with the mystery of salvation. Now the Greeks, we shall say, did they actually believe in these, in these deities, literally? I think they believed in them in this sense of the word that they recognized that it was possible to divide the activities of nature. That nature was not simply one force moving in upon the individual. It was an order of forces operating in various ways. That there were rules governing almost every aspect of human life and human conduct. That there was justice, and there was forgiveness, that there was strength, that there was wisdom, there was beauty, there was faith, there was love. All of these terms seem to imply a certain division within the substance of causal nature. It never occurred to the Greeks to assume that a principle could exist as an active agent without having a nature of some kind. Thus, when we think of the principle of wisdom, the Greeks could not divide this principle entirely from the idea of a titanic monad, or being, in whose nature wisdom was peculiarly exemplified. Or, if we wish to use the Chaldean terms, the Greeks believed that all of a quality arose from a common fountain of that quality. Therefore, that love was not something that had innumerable separate existences. Love was one force flowing from the fountains of universal love. That this one force manifested in innumerable ways or might be completely concealed from manifestation like a subterranean stream but it still had one nature in itself. This nature was the nature of a principle operating forever according to laws immutable and inevitable within itself. For this reason, these principles were referred to as gods. Over these principles ruled the sovereignty of Zeus. Zeus who carried with him the symbols of the thunderbolts, the power, the thunderer, the earth shaker. Now we do not know that Zeus was particularly good or particularly bad. Many of the legends about him would indicate that he had certain derelictions. Largely, however, even in the Greek myths, the grand program of his purpose is good. He is essentially seeking to reward the just and punish the unjust. And if he makes mistakes, he pays for them, like all of the mortals that surround him in nature. But the essential principle of Zeus is good. The principle of a deity ruling by the sovereignty of destiny. The sovereignty of possessing consciousness. And therefore, as the fountain of conscious existence, foredestined and predestined to be the governor of all things. Therefore, as the Emperor Julian says, 
one Zeus, one Son, one Spirit, our great Lord Jupiter. Thus, uh, we have in this concept the idea that Spirit, as we know it, is also one being, that we are not divided spiritually but by appearance only, and that the farther fountains of our spiritual existence constitutes the nature of Zeus or Jupiter, which is the nature of the self seeking to know, the eternal uh, searcher after realities, the governor who rules with a certain strange uncertainty, this immortal mortal uh, that can never completely solve the mystery of itself but it is given the power to solve the mystery of everything outside of itself. From this type of thinking, we can also go to Juno, or Hela, who is recalled or spoken of as the protectress of the home. And naturally, she is the one who is most unhappy when Zeus became, comes a little careless in his personal relations with gods, goddesses, and the like. But a Juno is forever demanding that the great laws of the home be preserved and protected. She represents, therefore, the strange power of inevitable culture, moving inevitably to the preservation of the good in things. She demands payment whenever the laws of human relationship on moral levels are violated. And although these laws be violated by gods, the punishment is the same.